All right. All right. Okay, welcome chat. The next couple of minutes are merely me trying to figure all of this crap out. So bear with me as I work on it and make sure I've got everything like it's supposed to be. All right, good evening. Just testing to make sure it's working. All right, good evening. Just testing to make sure it's working. All right, good evening. Okay, and it appears that I am live. So thank you for your patience, and feel free to skip all of that. So, what are we here about today? This is not Coffee Kegs and Kriegspiel, obviously. Um, I am far too southern sounding, and far too incompetent with this live streaming stuff so i appreciate the patience this is my first live stream ever and it is brought to you by whiskey because unlike actual professional naval historians which bring you their live streams with iron brew i need a hard drink to do this So, why are we staring at a map of the Virginia Capes? It's because in the American Civil War mega game that we just finished, well, finished over a month ago at this point, the Virginia Capes became the site of the Second Battle of the Capes, the Third Battle of the Capes, and so on and so forth, up to seven battles of the capes before we will be done with the naval side of this war tonight we're going to cover up through and including the first battle of the well the first battle of the capes during our version of the civil war which we which is the actually the second battle of the capes if we remember our history first battle of the capes happened during the revolutionary war where the french fleet under de gras under de, de grasse and i'm butchering that for any of our french speakers uh took on the royal navy and i won't say defeated so much as fended off the royal navy fleet 
which ultimately helped seal Cornwallis's fate at Yorktown and induce him to surrender because his naval resupply was cut off. Now, moving into the totality, and we're going to move to this one little spot over here off the Elizabeth River. There we go. It all begins right here at Gosport Navy Yard. That is where the saga of the naval war begins. Because as Carter has mentioned in other streams, due to some circumstances, our war did not begin at Fort Sumter as historical, but rather at Gosport Navy Yard. Now, to pull up my massive list of pinned posts in order to try to keep track of all of this. And for the record, I'm going to get so much of this wrong because there is just so much. So, to summarize, because there is so much to the politics that happened here, it would take an actual book to cover it. In our timeline, we had a player who was functioning as the head of the United States Navy, one Captain Commodore Admiral. He went by a couple of different titles, but ultimately he was, he was running the U.S. Navy in the pre-war era, McCarroll. McCarroll, to his credit, did see the issues that were going to arise if the large number of ships at Gosport Navy Yard, which is the only U.S. Navy Yard within the, within the southern states. And that's a key point to bring up, because Virginia was not one of the first seceding states so during this time period, it was still loyal to the Union. But McCarroll, seeing the writing on the wall, even though Virginia hadn't made any particular noises about leaving, and we followed pretty close to the actual progression of the state seceding. So Virginia was going to secede in what I call the kind of the end of the second wave of states that seceded. He was seeing the writing on the wall, so he made his decision to get the U.S. Navy out of Virginia. In doing so, it, he started making moves to get the U.S. Navy out of Virginia. It started creating issues be, because Virginians were noticing U.S. Navy ships be, that were in ordinary being prepped for sea. US, and for those of you who aren't aware, in ordinary is in reserve. That's... In the age of in the age of sail, that was what they called putting a ship in reserve, or mothballs. So, he started getting ships ready for sea. He was trying to get the entire U.S. fleet in Gosport, which included such notables as the USS United States, which is a War of eighteen twelve era forty four gun frigate. Um, and this, several ships of the line that the U.S. had built in the intervening years and well, pretty much laid up as soon as they were built. Some of them weren't even completed before they were laid up. But of note, and one that will be important, was the USS Merrimack, which was at Gosport Navy Yard. And was a fairly new and fairly modern wooden steam frigate 
at this point. Now, to delve into all of those details, um, the Confederate, not the Confederates, I'm sorry, the Virginia State Militia, and this is a key note, they were not Confederate, they were simply the local state, the local militia started showing up, and then the governor appointed one, one Colonel Jackson of VMI, Brevet Colonel Jackson, to command the Virginia State Militia, and they essentially did a blockade of Gosport Navy Yard. Think of it more as checkpoints um, with the intention of preventing the U.S. Navy from vacating the Navy Yard at first because Virginia was having issues with being treated poorly, and then second, because Virginia was was considering seceding and wanted and wanted to just put a general pause on all movement. Now, kind of in these same time frames, uh, the player that played McCarroll um, put forward several plans, schemes, other things. And they were well thought out for what they were, but they were also they were also uh, kind of at points touching on the "Are you sure?" department. Um, for instance, when it was brought up that when it was brought to his attention that uh, only Gosport Navy Yard was having its ships prepared for sea. And he needed an excuse because New York Navy Yard, um, Philadelphia, all of your other Navy Yards weren't preparing their ships for sea. His excuse was to say that there was a rumor that the British were sending ships to more ships to the Jamaica station in the Caribbean. When he was call, kind of called out on this, he produced what turned out to be a forged document saying the same. These combined to somewhat create a self-fulfilling prophecy in royally pissing off the British and making them think, and the British were played by umpires. We didn't have a player character for them because we had a hard and fast rule that was set by Carter as the game manager that we were not bringing in, that we were not turning this into World War I with muskets. We were not bringing in international players into the Civil War. so And that will factor into some other decisions that happen later on the umpire side. So the British do play by yours truly for the most part with Liam and a couple of other umpires assisting and um, kind of forming a council of international players. The British wound up sending a squadron to the Caribbean simply to counter what they believed was a U.S. move that was very aggressive and had, frankly, defrauded the Empire, defrauded the Royal Navy, and was, and they, and there were questions of if was the U.S. using trying to create a pretext to engage in an aggressive operation in the Caribbean to deal with its own, that whole common enemy abroad to deal with domestic troubles at home. Now, what ultimately comes of this, and we've kind of covered this in another stream, but what ultimately comes of this is um, President Buchanan, who was a non-player character, played by the entire umpire team as a council, um, prior to Lincoln taking office, ends up firing uh, Commodore McCarroll and arresting him and charging him with numerous charges uh, for court-martial. He is held in D.C. pending court-martial, and Lincoln takes office. Um, faced with not having faced with the Navy in complete disarray and having and the Navy having been told to stand down, the ships in Gosport having been told to make 
Sorry, had a small, small issue. Um, the ships in Gosport, having been told to uh, make them stop their preparations to make for making ready for sea, things that have been going on even despite the blockade. Ultimately, the once Lincoln takes over, he decides that yes, this is actually an idea we need to deal with. Plus, Virginia started to become quite inflamed against the against the federal government. And Virginia basically, if my recollections are correct, Virginia basically sends demands to the to the federal government that yes, we are looking at seceding, but uh, we want to do a amicable divorce, so to speak. Um, now Virginia is still considering this more as a political and legal matter, not at this moment as a purely military matter. Ultimately, Lincoln makes the decision and gives McCarroll permission to essentially raid their own port with a flotilla of small boats, go up the Elizabeth River, raid Gosport, get as many ships out as they can, burn the rest. Um, when this is attempted, it triggers the militia to storm Gosport. There's a brief firefight. It's not really significant in the grand scheme of things. What is significant is that a number of United States ships are seized. Um, principally, there were three ships of the line that were seized, along with the Merrimack. Now, those are sailing, not steamships of the line. So they're quite hilariously obsolete. They were ob they were functionally obsolete when they were put in ordinary, and they are definitely obsolete now. But it's three. But it's four more ships than the Confederate Navy had that morning. So with that, we start the saga of the Confederate Navy. Three of the ships, which were, and they changed all the names, and I did not keep a count of the original names, but the North Carolina was one of them. Um, the Pennsylvania was, Pennsylvania or Philadelphia was ultimately stripped for parts, and there were two others. I think the New York might have been another. They were ultimately renamed, and they are irrelevant for the rest of the war, aside from being a force that the U.S. Navy has to consider might one day come out of Gosport Navy Yard. Um, the Confederates made the decision to strip a lot of the gun, well, not strip the guns off of them, but take a lot of the guns that were being stored for them for other duties and to raze them down into frigates to use them for raiding at a later point. Now, all the in this game in particular, the Union was... the. The, sorry, the Confederates were highly maritime-oriented. In history, they were not. They, they made attempts, but they were very, almost schizophrenic in their attempts. In this game, it, it was from, from the president on down, there was a very well-defined naval strategy of seize the coast, Seize the coast, fortify the coast, fortify the key points in our logistics chain, and develop a fleet. At first, develop a fleet to rate to attempt to prevent a blockade, or or barring that to raid Union shipping and create massive problems for the Union in its attempts. Now, to that end, all of the one of the other consequences that the umpires allowed to occur due to a lot of the a lot of Union Navy posturing and actions was the Union Navy was and historical note, the Union Navy was predominantly not secessionist. The Union Navy was predominantly unionist, whether they were whether they were northern or southern. They were not they were not in large part.
secessionists, and there were fair, a fair, fairly small number of of Union of U.S. Navy officers that joined the Confederacy, compared to say the Army. There was quite a quite a gap there. Um, one of those that joins is John Mercer Brook, who develops the Brook rifle, and there's a couple there's a couple of others what we ended up allowing as a consequence was that historically he doesn't get involved in the naval side till a little bit later and once the war's already started due to the navy's very aggressive actions very early on before there's even a war and essentially aggressive actions against a state that at that moment didn't not did not feel itself to be Confederate, but a union, but a part of the Union. Um, Brooke and a couple of others basically offer their services to the nascent Confederate government, and so the Confederacy was allowed to design one ship that it would basically get the get through the design period for free. No more, but they could design one ship that they could get one ship or class they could get through the design period for free. And their choice was what I what I labeled as an ironclad brig. So a sailing and steamship. Um, the analog would be the CSS Stonewall. Uh, so we're looking at a ship with just with just three guns with relatively decent iron plates but only only on limited portions of the ship and really designed as a high seas raider not as a line of battle vessel it was not designed to go toe to toe more designed as a ship that for instance if the Alabama had been one of these ships it probably would have beaten the Kearsarge and probably would have beaten the Kearsarge with enough with enough left to do more than just limp back into port badly damaged. It might indeed have been able to take on a single Union ship like that and continue on operations, at least for a short while. So ultimately, they opt very early to lay down six of these, um, which I found ironic given that given that the first real class of warships laid down by the United States was six frigates. They were technically two classes, but we won't get into we won't get into details. So they lay six of these down. They're never launched before the game ends. Would have been interesting to see what they did with the way the paradigm had shifted. But as the as the as the war begins and as Virginia secedes that's where we find ourselves the confederacy has laid down six small what will ultimately be ironclad at least partially ironclad ships and they have three old ships of the line that they are tearing apart to make into three commerce raiding sailing frigates and a lone modern steam frigate that they captured almost entirely intact. That was a bad role on the part of the Union force that attempted to raid Gosport and get their ships out or burn them, that the Confederates were able to overrun the Merrimack and seize it before the Union was able to either get it out of the port or fire the ship. Historically, the Union fired the ship and the Confederates had to raise it before they could turn it into the CSS Virginia. In our timeline, the CSS Virginia is not an ironclad, but rather a steam frigate with moder- with fairly modern lines. So, moving into... That is, what ha- that is how everything begins. Now, moving into our next incidents, and I'm going to switch maps on us real quick. 
And these maps are going to be a little further out. But it will not be too terribly irrelevant. Um, he is not available. Otherwise, I would have him on. Actually, neither of the sec navs were, are available. And I reached out to a couple of other people that were involved in this. And they are not available tonight either. Once this finishes loading. The Confederate Secretary of the Navy pretty much immediately, and Carter covered this, go back to the, kind of the end of that to see, but the Confederate Secretary of the Navy fairly immediately launched into clearing out all of the Union forts. Um, the forts in Charleston get seized, uh, as was historical. The Fort Pulaski is ultimately seized. Um, Within, within a month, month and a half. And the fort down in Pensacola, it takes, Fort Pickens takes a little longer, but it does get seized not long after this turn. The big and important part is, and it is gray in this particular one, is Fort Monroe. So everything south of the river, everything south of the Hampton Roads was seized when Virginia seceded. All the, but the U.S. still maintained Fort Monroe, and the U.S. Navy did move a couple of extra regiments of Marines into Fort Monroe. This was kind of a blessing and a curse. The blessing was that, yes, Fort Monroe was practically unassailable by direct assault. and Colonel Jackson and the South Carolina State Militia formed up to the north of it, cutting it off from any sort of resupply by land, and the Navy was resupplying it by small boat from, from literally from sea. The curse of moving those troops in was that they created an unsustainable supply situation for 1861. We're not on Guadalcanal, we're not on Saipan or Iwo Jima, They're not, we're not hauling landing craft moving at several knots ashore bringing large amounts of supply. You've got guys in rowboats and some small steam launches that are moving supplies to the fort because anything bigger is getting shot at. Um, relatively quickly, the Secretary of the Navy took some of the guns from Gosport Navy Yard, which historically over 200 guns were seized and about the same number were seized in our game. Um, but just took guns and put them here. Alt later dug in artillery here into two fully dug in batteries. But brought guns to Willoughby Point, which basically cut the Hampton Roads from, in from shipping and prevented uh, ships from being able to do much. So they were resupplying it by small boat. Ultimately, the fort was getting starved out. They wound up withdrawing some of the Marines to try to stretch their logistics and keep the fort supplied, but it's, it's a matter of time, and eventually Colonel Jackson and his militia are able to batter the north wall of the fort down enough that they are able to with great difficulty seize the fort and force it to surrender i think at the end there were only about 1200 marines in the fort and they were at that point practically out of food and anything besides small arms ammo um but it was that that was pretty much the situation they were at when they were finally forced to capitulate uh, so the U.S. Navy puts a fleet under McCarroll, a, a flotilla, based out of Baltimore, under McCarroll, on the bay. The U.S., as it's getting ships activated, and that's one thing to keep in mind, is that while the U.S. Navy, by the end of the war, would be into the hundreds of ships, the U.S. Navy at the beginning of the war had a surprisingly small number of ships that were actively in service, and quite a number of them were all over the place. 
We had a couple of ships in the Far East. We had a number of ships in the European theater, some in West, some in West Africa, and then a few that were kind of patrolling up and down the East and West Coast. So all of the active ships, word had to reach them. So telegrams had to be sent to ports that were accessible by telegraph, and ships had to be sent with word to telegram to other ports by ships that for ships that weren't going to a port that was accessible by the U.S. One point of note is that the first transatlantic cable was laid just prior to the Civil War. It was only up for a few week for a couple weeks, went down, and the next transatlantic cable was laid after the war, or right at the end. So communication, your fastest communication was approximately ten days across the Atlantic. Uh, that was about as fast as you could get a ship across the Atlantic to take word. So the U.S. Navy really had best of my recollection, less than 30 ships on the east coast of the United States at the beginning of the war. And keep in mind, they lost one of those active ships, the the Merrimack, here at Norfolk, right at the start. And it was that was one of their most powerful ships. Not the most, but one of the most powerful ships in the U.S. Navy. I mean, the Merrimack slash renamed the Virginia. It was a 20, 20 some gun frigate. And those guns were, those guns were eight inches. This is, this is me having to remember. Unfortunately, that ship was heavily modified and my spreadsheet reflects the heavy modifications that were given later. So, moving on, the U.S. does start throwing out a blockade. Um, kind of the, the problem that they're running into is that when you're trying to blockade this coastline, first, one thing that both sides kind of knew, the Confederates were much more keenly aware of it, is if you follow my cursor, if you come up the Elizabeth River, And then over through the canal to the Dismal Swamp Canal. Or you can go from Suffolk up the Jericho Canal to Lake Drummond and then over to the Dismal Swamp Canal. You can pick up the Pascatank River at South Mills, ride it all the way to ride it all the way out to the Albemarle Sound. That is key because that series of canals connects the inside of the Hampton Roads to the entire coastline of North Carolina because once you hit once you get into the the Pascatank River you now have access to the Albemarle Sound to to the inlets to the north to the inlets uh, south of Nags Head here at Oregon Inlet, to the inlets by Cape Hatteras and um, Ocracoke Inlet here, Cape Lookout, Moorhead City. Well, Beaufort's the more important port at that moment. Uh, Moorhead City is the real city today, but Beaufort is the more important port city at the at this point. And functionally, all the way down to Bogue Inlet, without ever once touching the Atlantic Ocean. So it's called the Intracoastal Waterway. It's still used today, mostly recreationally. There's a little commercial barge traffic on it, but it's mostly a recreational thing these days for yachts and uh, sailboats and things because they can move without having to worry about going out into the breakers. But this was a very big functional thing. And you have to keep in mind that worldwide road and rail transportation even today does not hold a candle to water transportation for volume. And in this time period, 
especially for the Confederacy, this was a vital transport artery. Um, historically, it was cut. It was cut in the winter of sixty one, sixty two, and it created a lot of logistical problems for at that point Lee's army. But this is a vital bit of water. Bit of water here. And then you obviously you have your major port at Wilmington. You have your major port at Charleston. Your major port at Savannah. Uh, some minor ports along the coast. And then your next kind of port area is Pensacola Bay, Mobile Bay, and then on to New Orleans. And that is that is your Confederacy's kind of land forces. Well, I'm sorry, kind of ports for its supplying all of its land forces from Europe. And keep in mind, trade is important to the United States. Trade is a life or death to the Confederacy in this game. Um, if they had been fully blockaded, then their economy would immediately start to degrade heavily and rapidly. So Navally, they took a lot of care in setting up these forts. Um, actually, Oregon Inlet was protected um, very quickly. They built they built they built some floating batteries. There's nothing more than a barge with some guns on it, and put them in a couple of vital inlets to stop to try to prevent attempts to force the inlets by the U.S. Navy while they were building batteries or building forts. And they immediately launched in anywhere they controlled, they fortified, and anywhere they didn't control, they sent troops down there and started besieging it and slowly digging the digging the U.S. forces out. Um, they were very methodical and relentless in getting in getting the U.S. out of anything in this on the entire southern coastline and fortifying everything that they could get their hands on. Um, a lot of the guns at Gosport wound up in fortifications all down the coast, and that pretty much matches historical in that in that regard. Getting back, the Union Navy did build a squadron here um, of six ships in Chesapeake Bay to close that, because obviously the Hampton Roads is your fastest way to get shipping in, and once the Confederates owned the Hampton Roads, it had to be closed from the outside. You couldn't use Fort Monroe to close the Hampton Roads. Um, the Union also engaged in blockading, putting squadrons off at point various times, Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah, uh, for the most part, but they also put some off the Gulf Coast in a couple places. The way that I ran it for game purposes, I needed a quick way to do this because this gets complex. What I did was I considered that if you put a ship on blockade duty, that you told me where the ship was going to be on blockade duty, and then I added it to that blockading squadron, and I treated that ship as if it went out, did blockading for a few weeks, went back to a friendly port to resupply um, if, it was, if it had coal power for any of its stuff, potentially refuel a bit and rewater, um, but for reprovision and kind of do a turnaround. So the way that I treated it with the D20s was that every ship you put on block, every ship in a blockading squadron was one side of a D20. So if you had 20 ships in a blockading squadron, I consider that to be a string of ships going back and forth from home port to blockading station but there always being enough ships on that station to permanently block anything from getting through unless it was escorted and fought its way out. So 20 ships on a blockading station, so 20 ships off Mobile Bay would effectively halt all attempts to run the blockade off Mobile Bay. Uh, the Union, at this point early on in the war, never, didn't have the ships to do it, and at no point actually put enough ships to seriously threaten trade. There were some weeks that, because you roll the D20 every week, unless there are 20 ships on the blockade. And there are some weeks that the, that the roll was high and the Union managed to successfully seal that port. But most weeks, the blockade was fairly ineffective. 
um, at least on the on the totality. There were ports that were closed. But let's get into one particular incident called the Persia Affair, or the Persia Incident. Uh, very much, if you want the historical analog, the Trent Affair. Um, I'm getting over to the correct stream, correct part of this. I want to make sure I get this get this right. So May 16th, so fairly early on, um, the Secretary of the Navy, they, they, it was not McCarroll in his role. He was rehabilitated and put in command of some ship of shipping, but it was but a Secretary of the Navy was appointed, um, was was put in place that was not him. So he was working for someone. Um, and that Secretary of the Navy was Secretary Shanks. He he had announced that the southern ports were closed due to various things. He had not announced a blockade because a blockade implies it's a foreign port. He was simply, I am the, I am the government of the United States, and I'm saying that my ports here are closed and that you should go to ports in the north, and that is that. Um, this wasn't, I won't say well-received or ill-received, it was pretty much ignored. Uh, historical note, post-Crimea, the most of your European nations, your major powers, entered into some, some agreements and conventions, one of which was that if you're going to declare a blockade, you have to put enough ships on the blockade to to seriously create it. If you do not create an effective blockade, it is not a blockade. And it kind of kind of clarified the old I'm declaring that I'm blockading something and now I'm using that as an excuse to just shoot everything in sight. Uh, you actually had to make a give it the good college try of blockading. So Secretary Shanks declares that he is He's closing the southern ports, and then he comes back and, upon being questioned on that, is adamant that these closures are not a blockade and that no ships of neutral parties shall be seized unless they're conducting illegal activity or flying the flag of a U.S. state in rebellion. Um, and I'm quoting from him, specifically, there should be little, if any, reason for a U.S. ship to interact with, let alone board a neutral ship in international waters. He makes these statements around May 14th, 13th, somewhere in that time frame. It's very tight. What he doesn't know is that at sea, let's see, seeing which ship it is. I'm not noting that in the news article that one of our wonderful players noted. Made up. We had players that were making news articles and they're invaluable when it comes to trying to do this history of this game. The day after. So he makes this he makes this announcement on the 15th that explains his port closure policy. And what it is, fun what he's functionally said is that foreign shipping going to the ports of states in rebellion would be met by U.S. Navy ships and turned around, told to go, told to go. Hey, you can't go to Charleston. Um, go to Baltimore instead, or you can't go to Charleston or Savannah. Go to New York instead, and we'll get your goods where they're supposed to go. What he didn't know is that a few days before he makes this announcement, the RMS Persia, which is a real Cunard line steamer, um, which is an RMS Royal Mail ship, that ha happened to be carrying no, no war materials whatsoever, just some civilian cargo, mail, passengers. A lot, quite a number of those British citizens, businessmen, 
you know, doing their usual, doing their usual business in the cotton trade. Um, well, that, that is seized by the USS Niagara in international waters or what at the time would be considered international waters. Today we call it exclusive economic zone, but that didn't exist back then. Uh, so waters that the Royal Navy would consider international. This ship had been seized and the day after he makes his announcement, clarifying that, no, we are not going to molest foreign shipping. We're just going to politely tell them that they should go elsewhere and that these ports are closed. The RMS Persia comes sailing into Baltimore Harbor under a prize crew with the USS Niagara not too far behind it, happy as a clam that it seized a ship that was trying to run the blockade. This causes about the reaction you would expect amongst the uh, the British at being played by the the collective umpires, which is the British are apoplectic. Remember, the U the United States Navy is a annoying little upstart at this point. The Royal Navy is the undisputed master of the seas and has been since Trafalgar. And one of their Royal Mail steamers just got seized and put under a prize crew. So there's a lot of anger <laughs> crossing the Atlantic. Um, this isn't helped by some back and forth that is kind of going on at the same time and continues thereafter. Uh, the British ambassador was regularly called to the White House, mostly for dressing downs about why the British are even talking to the Confederates at all. Because the British did have uh, Lord Palmerston was kind of in Richmond unofficially, not a consulate, just a I'm a British official that will hear things if you come and tell me in my hotel room. Um, he wasn't there as a as an ambassador. There was no embassy or official recognition, but he was paying attention if people came and talked to him. That really irritated the union player, the union team. Um, that the British were talking or listening to the Confederates at all. And there was a lot of back and forth to include semi-regular threats of war between, or either threatening war with the British Empire or asking the ambassador if the British Empire was at war with the United States. That, that was a semi-regular event uh, for quite a number of terms. Ultimately, this creates a lot of this kind of creates a lot of tension between the British Empire and the United States. Keeping in mind, this is all going on pre Manassas, which we've covered in the last episode. The British, and I own this decision. And if you remember early in this stream, I said there was a hard ban on having a British player. In hindsight, the proper solution at this point would have been a limited British action, a special military operation, so to speak, of the British sending a squadron to sail up and down the U.S. East Coast and basically thumb its nose at the United States Navy and prevent the U.S. Navy from blockading Confederate ports as a giant screw you because you're acting like a bunch of children and you're, bull you're trying to bully the biggest guy in the yard. That should have been the solution. Ultimately, we wound up making a different one, which I'm going to get to in just a second. Mistakes were made. The British had started to engage in a... Because both sides were practically begging to purchase ships. The U.S. was trying to get ships in the water uh, as fast as it could go. It needed to build a blockade. The Confederates needed blockade busters. And the, Confederate, the Confederates were very naval-focused. Ultimately, that was to their detriment in their numbers of troops that they were able to deploy on land, especially in 1861. But they were extremely naval-focused. In fact, I think the Confederate States Navy had it 
as large of a budget as the Confederate States Army, if not slightly larger if you count the uh, money bag fleet. The apologies. So that gets us Let's see. So that pretty much catches us up. That gets us close. Yes, that catches us up to the Persia incident catches us up to the Battle of Manassas. So that gets our timeline. We're getting our timeline straight. That catches us up to the Battle of Manassas where what happened happened. Uh, if you want to listen to that, go to the previous stream on this series. The Kind of the next situation that blows up and we're and we are skipping the land war, by the way. There are things going on in the land war that we are skipping. Eastern and Western theater. Um, the next kind of the next situation is the US had ships, but just a couple and not a ton, um, on blockade duty. Uh, and that was the function of they didn't have that much in the way of shipping that was active. And they were trying to keep their more powerful ships marshaled into a force because the Confederates did have those three old ships of the line, and there was some fear that if they were able to break out, they would cause a lot of problems before they could get run down. So... Ultimately, these ships never factored in. They were being modified for the entire time of the game. Um, but the Virginia had been able to get out to sea. And the Virginia comes in on Charleston, and at that, po at that moment, the USS Brandywine, which is a really a sloop of war and not steam-powered, is on blockade duty. So a, steam a modern steam frigate pounces on a less modern sail sloop and the battle goes about as you would expect um, because Virginia is ultimately able to able to maneuver at will and guarantee that it's going to be able to get a raking broadside and after that it's pretty much all over but the crying um, keep in mind we are talking large caliber shell guns so these battles when they occur once hits start getting scored things are going to go extraordinarily quick so that's really the first the first battle um to which secretary shank um, shanks immediately sends out sink the merrimack orders and um mccarroll's force is dispatched goes out to sea um uh, the joys of communication in this time period mean that the Virginia is basically able to run circles around him simply by, by dint of, by the time he gets information on where the Virginia is, it's moved on. It goes out to sea, does a raiding cruise and comes back to Charleston. Um, when McCarroll is out at sea trying to find him. Um, there's a lot of this when you don't have a ton of ships, you wind up in situations where you're playing a lot of chasey chasey around in circles. Then we move, then we move a little further. So as I said, the British were putting ships up kind of at a, kind of at a silent auction, so to speak, both, both sides would put up their bid of what they thought they, of what they wanted to pay for an individual ship. And the British would take the highest bidder and send it. The Union won both both bids for ships that were bid. Um, but the Union was also, at, and I distinctly remember this one, where the President threatened to declare war on the British because the British were offering to were putting the ships up for auction instead of simply 
selling them to the United States and only to the United States. Basically implying that the British were by dint of allowing a bidding process at all, the, making the Confederacy legitimate, and there was a lot of anger. Of course, the this is the same Union that had been threatening war with the British for weeks. So the British took it in stride. In a weird conundrum, the umpires, this is, and this is where that mistake was made. The umpires, we were scratching our heads at how do we do this? Because every sign pointed that the Royal Navy would, would have instituted a blockade of several Union ports or Copenhagen the Union fleet or done something to remind them of their place in the world. And with the hard... With the hard prohibition, we made the decision when um, the Confederate president put forward the question of instead of this, instead of all of this bidding stuff, what if I sent a guy with twenty million dollars in gold to England and said, "I'm I'm going to pay you a million dollars a ship." But I want this number of ships, and I want them to be this class. And so we priced it out and realized that basically at that price rate, the Royal Navy could offload some of its decent ships, but a lot of its oldest ships that were still in active service. And turn around and build 20 copies of HMS Warrior functionally win an ironclad arms race overnight. So we said, why not? And the money bag fleet was born. Um, ultimately, and I will read off the ships that were sold. So the ships that were sold were the HMS Rodney, the HMS Nile, the HMS London, the HMS Abakir, and the HMS Sens Parai. Um. Yep, those were the sh those were ships of the line. Then you had frigates: HMS Vulture, HMS Terrible, HMS Avenger, HMS Sidon, HMS Odin, HMS Magician, HMS Liffey, HMS Shannon. There was irony there. I picked that ship on purpose because of the irony with the War of eighteen twelve. HMS Topaz, HMS Euro Euralis. HMS Imperius, HMS Curacao, and HMS Dauntless. And these cover the gamut of capabilities. Um, for game purposes, I classed guns into kind of three categories. Guns that were under your kind of six to eight inches, six, well, yeah, six to nine inches, I classed as, I classed, I treated them in groups of four to six, and I treated them as a battery of heavy guns. Um, I think your 24 and, four, 24 and 32 pounders, for the most part, would be under that category. Um, guns of that six point that six to nine inches, I cast as I classed as naval guns, and then guns nine inches and up, I classed as heavy naval guns. The difference between naval guns and heavy naval guns is negligible in wooden ship on wooden ship combat but did have a factor if you're dealing with fortifications or ironclads, which will become important in a few episodes. Um, and these ships are all over the map. Some of the, for instance, you have, and keep in mind, frigate, ship of the line, and sloop in this time period did not necessarily reflect what the guns were. 30, 30, 40 years before this, if you said a if you said a third rate ship of the line, you knew that was seventy four to eighty guns, and the lower decks were twenty four pounders. The upper decks were going to be eighteen pounders, maybe twelve, maybe some twelve pounders. You knew what the guns were going to be. Um, for instance, HMS Sans Pari, which is a ship of the line, has six naval guns and. 10 batteries, battery block equivalents of heavy guns, of guns smaller than 6 inches. 
Whereas HMS Sidon, a frigate, had 26 naval guns, so guns 6 to 9 inches in caliber. Apologies. So, that is kind of where we sit. The money bag fleet is purchased. Um, and to get you a, t- a better timeline, So this is getting around July 20th is when the word really gets back to the U.S. That the Confederates have entered into this naval deal to make this purchase. And with this purchase is also coming hiring a bunch of -of out-of-work sailors. It was not uncommon for Royal Navy officers on half pay to go work for second and third rate navies. It was kind of a way the Royal Navy kept its officer its officer corps well trained that's well documented uh the a lot of royal navy officers were in south america at this time um working for the various south american navies because they could draw a half pay half pay salary from the from the british and the full pay salary from somebody else so they were they were doing a lot of that so there was a, there was quite a bit of hiring of cross hiring. So these ships weren't empty and devoid of crew as they're coming across the Atlantic. But July twentieth is when the deal struck and thing and things are started to repair. But it's going to be a while before these ships get here. This does cause mass panic in the U.S. government that because at the at this point they only know they don't they only know that. Something is in, that estimates are saying at least eighteen ships are going to are getting released from British service. They don't know how many have been purchased. They don't know what the deal is. All they know is that the British are offloading a large number of ships very quickly. Um, and the Confederacy seems to be about to purchase them, or technically not the Confederacy. Technically, several different states that all happened to be Southern just collectively brought a bunch of money and said, Hey, we are States that are part of this country you recognize. So, um, let us buy stuff from you. Like I said, mistakes were made on our part. I take ownership of my, of my role, my major role in that, but it was a decision that was made. It causes mass panic in the U S forces. Also, we wound up instituting the consequence that once the full, kind of the fullness of the effect of this fell upon the uh, British populace, that the government fell and was replaced. The prime minister and his cabinet were ultimately rather rapidly replaced, and the British took a much more isolationist stance. So this was kind of the last time the British factor into this war in any real way. Because they're dealing with in the crap at home, the so now we are getting into around July twenty around that same time in July, slightly after. Um, there's a small problem: the U.S. government doesn't get around to making a budget. Just like our modern federal government, U.S. Congress, which was run by players, couldn't seem to, got all caught up in everything else besides figuring out where to spend money. So the Navy runs out of a, runs out of its budget. Now, it was also building about 100 ships, but it runs out of the budget. Um, and as the, and as the news noted, um, just what is the scale of this calamity when the Navy yards start halting work as there's no more money to pay people or buy go- or buy things to do it? Um, there was the USS Wabash was being converted into an ironclad. Think 
Merrimack to Virginia here for what was being done to her. Five, um, what ultimately be monitors, eight and 18 gunboats and sloops that were under construction were all, all had to be halted. Um, there, there were a lot of, a lot of problems and Secretary Shanks ended up eating what was, what, what was, we all called the Shanks Clause, where he had to ask Congress individually go to Congress for every new ship and ask permission when they finally got around to giving him a budget. So he was under extreme scrutiny for every ship purchase decision because he had taken, he had taken what money he had been issued and had burned through it extremely quickly in trying to build the U S Navy up. But he was also not really given enough money to do the build up for the job he was being asked to do. Although between this panic and the panic with um, the Confederates suddenly having a battle fleet, he he got enough money to build to build his ships, but he did have to he did have to spend quite a number of months asking permission to build anything. It was functionally a moratorium on new construction, and he had to build what he was working on first. Now, moving for a little further into July, there's some other stuff. We're, Carter's going to get into the weeds on the land war. We're going to skip through because what is important at sea is that the Virginia does a raid. The Brandywine renamed the Alabama also does a raid out at sea. A couple of ships are seized. Maritime insurance rates are starting to rise as there's as there's it's not they're not privateers they're full fledged warships are out at sea doing things here and there and kind of thumbing their noses at the union's attempt to blockade them but keep in mind the union is also starting to union in, in late July and into August is also starting to coalesce August 28th, the USS Mohican, which was on patrol, it's on patrol off the western coast of Europe, specifically off the Channel and around Ireland, looking for this Confederate fleet, this fleet that's going to change flags once it gets out of British waters and be Confederate. They don't know what quite what's in it yet. They don't realize that it is 20 ships, including six ships of the line and 14 steam frigates. Now, a good chunk of those steam frigates are very poorly armed paddle frigates. And those ships of the line, half of them are relatively old and worn out. But they, they're all steam ships. That was the requirements where they all had to be steam powered. And six of them had to be technically multiple deck ships of the line, and the others and the others had to be frigates, not sloops. That was the only requirement. So the British offloaded a, quite a bit of crap, but they had to offload a couple of decent ships in the mix to make the deal. Um, so the USS Mohican, which is steam powered, returns to returns to port around the 28th, and says that the Moneybag fleet has left European waters and that the USS Independence, which is an older, sail-powered frigate, uh, have been run down and either sunk or captured. Um, basically, they ran into each other in the fog off the western coast of Europe. The Mohican, being steam-powered, was able to was able to get its boiler warmed up, get up enough steam, and get out of the way, and then run as fast as it could for port while the independence getting jumped at relatively close range was unable to get away and was ultimately run down and captured. Uh, I think it was actually sunk. So the U S starts forming the grand fleet, which is there, which is they are pulling all the blockade fleets together. They're pulling everything. Sail-powered, steam-powered, it's all coming together in Baltimore. 
as the Grand Fleet of the Republic. And the showdown is about to begin. Now, unfortunately, I did not. Run, I was not the one running the tabletop on that battle. I was working night shift when that battle went down, so I do not have that particular engagement. What I have is the same map because we did so many battles of the capes that. I think every umpire has a map of the Battle of the Capes at, in their saves. Um, everything the the areas noted in white are shoals. These are areas you have to wor worry about. Um, possibility of running aground exists. All of that. Um, if you will note, when we looked at the other map, the Confederates had built batteries over here. They had built batteries over on Willoughby Point and Sewell's Point. But they never got around to building bat anything at Cape Henry. Um, talking to the Confederate Secretary of the Navy later, this was a mistake. But he never got around to building it. At the early on, he couldn't because the U.S. Navy was able to just pull right offshore and bombard anything he worked on. So he was unable to do it. But ultimately, the Confederate fleet arrives in the Virginia Capes and meets the U.S. fleet coming down. And there is a there is a firefight that occurs all in here. And these ranges are relatively distant. There were quite a bit of distant engagements in these in these fights. Not the not the pulling side to side where where you're yard arms are getting tied into each other, um, bumping into each other and dealing with those issues of cutting shrouds to get untangled. No, the ships were sitting mostly at about a thousand yards, which is about the extent of their shooting capabilities. They were sitting at, at a mile plus um, at times, shooting at each other, which starts to get quite random, especially for ships that are rocking at sea in an age when you didn't have any sort of stabilization for guns or even or even fire control systems whatsoever, aside from the Mark One eyeball and pull and snatch on a friction primer, and those that's your fire control. So. But what, what people found, and my system tried to take into account, is that in an age of wooden ships and explosive shell guns, combat is, once, once hits start landing, combat is very short, very sharp, very deadly. Um, sh these ships are designed to withstand a bit of a pounding from a 24-pounder ball, maybe a 32-pounder ball. None of these ships are designed to withstand two, three, four, eight-inch shell hits exploding in their gun decks or in the bowels of the ship. So it is a ultimately the first battle of the Capes is an absolute nightmare. Um. Uh, September 16th is when it occurs. Um, the Union Fleet gets the worst of it. The Union Fleet had quite a number of sloops. Um, really, it was not so much the number of guns on either side. It was the durability of the ships. Sloops and gunboats... Don't have a, don't have that much in the way of freeboard. They don't have that much in the way of mass or numbers of personnel to absorb serious damage. So a lot of their ships were crippled or crippled or just blasted and started taking on water before they before they had a chance to get telling blows in. Whereas the Confederate ships just tended to have more size in their favor. And could absorb a couple hits before they got in really dire straits unless they took something critical. A lot of hits were ultimately critical hits. A lot of boiler explosions. Ships were, these ships on both sides were just getting absolutely torn apart. Um, the, I'll pull it up in particular. 
Yep, the Confederate fleet arrived in Charleston September 4th um, and then just got moving again. Um, one thing noting on how we did the naval battles, for people used to a land Kriegspiel where you get to send orders every turn, get to get all sorts of communications. Battles at sea tended to be more of, I come up with a plan and then through the use of flags, I can, in some semaphore, I can kind of change that plan slightly, but I'm pretty much locked into the locked into a battle plan once it gets going. So a lot of these, we would move ships until we hit major decision points or points where the plan created by the player noted that captains would, you know, either have, have a, a tree of orders or they would have, or they would make a separate decision based on the situation. So, and also one thing to note is that weather gauge is important, but it's not as important because you have steam power and the Chesapeake Bay is not that big. So you you can kind of operate fully on steam power um, off this. So going back to the prelude to the to the second battle of the Capes, remember the first one was uh, during the Rev War. Second Battle of the Capes, September 9th, the Confederate fleet arrived off Moorhead. They had started off they had started kind of on the fifth off of Charleston. So they arrive off Moorhead City, Fort Macon, and a small boat comes out to meet them, brings word from Willoughby Point in the Chesapeake Bay that as of this morning, so via telegraph, the Union fleet was not near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. They were actually up near Baltimore. They were getting they were getting themselves ready to go to come out and try to find the Confederate fleet as soon as they knew where the Confederate fleet was. Um, September 10th, uh, he gets a little more info from Willoughby Point that the Union fleet is not sailed, that they can see. And then September 11th, he gets a reply from the Confederate Secretary of the Navy. He had requested, he had given him that reply. He was off of Moorhead. He had given that reply, requested further orders. September 11th, he gets a reply to move to block off Chesapeake um, to essentially try to bottle up the Union fleet. And when he arrives on September 14th, a single Union ship is down by the Hampton Roads, immediately makes steam, flees up the bay towards Baltimore. And he is off the capes, blocking, kind of doing what Admiral de Grasse was doing historically, uh, blocking the capes from, from action. So he sends a ship, so the Confederates send a ship, and I'm coming from the Confederate side mostly because they're, they had the same commander for the entire, for this fleet, for the entire war, so it does make for a very concise set of posts. Um, the Union fleet kind of bounces between commanders and it gets difficult to read. The, on the 15th, um, a one of the Confederate ships that had been sent somewhat up the bay to scout comes running back saying that the U.S. fleet has left Baltimore Harbor, estimated 20 to 30 ships, and that their other their other scouting fleet is their other scouting ship is behind them and trying to maintain distance, but keep a keep an eye on the Union fleet as it moves. Um, this is the evening of the 15th, so right before the battle. The uh, 
that's when the fleet goes. Now, keeping in mind, and I will outline it, these are not the same ships. This is from a different Battle of the Capes, but it's good enough to outline. Keep in mind that, roughly speaking, the Confederate fleet is in squadrons, as they would be wanting to do, but the Confederate fleet is steaming off the Capes and sailing off the Capes, kind of around in this area. Whereas the Union force is, they're in columns, they're not purely one line, but the Union force is coming down from Baltimore. So, unfortunately, the Union is kind of in a Trafalgar scenario set up on them where they are going to have to run straight at the enemy line the enemy has their T crossed, and there's not a whole lot they can do about it. Yep. And keep in mind, the maximum possible range is about three miles. And that is like perfect conditions, known ranges, and your accuracy is questionable. Um, effective range starts to get about a thousand yards or so. And this is what I told both sides. Your effective range where you can see ships, you can hit ships. It's still going to have a bit of randomness. But presuming you get a good broadside off with enough guns, you can probably one of those is probably going to hit is about a thousand yards. But um like but for instance where in the age of sail you might close to a couple hundred yards before laying into a ship with a broadside. If you did that with the these guns, that two hundred yards is going to be an absolutely devastating broadside from almost anything. So just keep in mind that ships are further apart, and as they get close, the combat is going to get deadly fast. So, and I'm going to read, the Union one is about the same, but it is quite... Um, quite a bit harder to find. I actually have struggled to find it this evening. Um, I'm going to read, read you the battle report for the battle from the Confederate side of this battle is September 16th. Your first taste of battle showed how utterly devastating modern shell guns are against wooden vessels. Your fleet moved to close and the Union fleet offered battle on a parallel course meaning that both fleets steamed in stately lines trading fire until the intervening mileage is nothing more than a fog bank interspersed with crippling with crippled shipping. Your frigates in the main line of battle suffered cruelly, and the CSS Florida was torn to shreds in the fighting. Ultimately, you were able to turn the Union line, and they withdrew back towards Baltimore. In the final stages of the battle, a lone U.S. frigate, the XRN, Royal Navy frigate Humility, which is which is one that the U.S. had just purchased from the British prior to this thing, and that was purchased at auction. Um, fended off your somewhat disorganized line before her magazines exploded under the sustained fire of most of your ships. Your flagship CSS Anubis, he the Confederates had renamed all of the. Um, British ships. The Anubis was originally the uh, HMS Abakir. Was hard hit in the fighting, and you got your chance to see the elephant as shells rip through your decks, crew, and sails. As it stands, you managed to sink four Union ships, including the Humility, and capture the USS Minnesota and the USS Columbia. You also know that you did damage or cripple a number of Union vessels and estimate that most, if not all, of the Union ships have some degree of damage from the fighting. They had a total of 26 ships present, a mixture of sloops and frigates, but powerfully armed for their size, which caused a lot of damage to your vessels. That's a key note, is that, yes, the Confederates had ships of the line. However, their ships of the line were older and pretty 
predominantly they had a deck of more modern guns, but they were predominantly armed with older, lighter guns. Um, overall, there were on both sides there were frigates that could easily go toe to toe with a ship of the line and almost be guaranteed a win. Um, on both sides in almost in pretty much every battle. There were sloops that were equipped with twenty with twenty large naval guns in this in this game, and that's historical. The lines were very blurred. It was more a case of how of how heavily built the ship is, how large the ship is, not what the ship is gunned with at this point. So, to give you an idea, now keep in mind this is September sixteenth. Um, the end of the battle, the at the end of the second battle of the Capes, the first battle of this war, the Confederate States lost two of it of their brand new to them uh, wooden steam frigates. They had one, two, three, four, five, six ships. Uh, including two ships of the line and four steam frigates, all crippled, all in Gosport Navy Yard until some some getting out in November of sixty one and some getting out in January of sixty two. Um, and then of and then three more ships that needed several weeks of repairs. Um, with only two ships captured, uh, the U.S. ended up losing. They ended up losing more ships. They lost quite a number of ships and had quite a number of crippled. But that was a that was a pretty bad, pretty bad loss for the U.S. But it wasn't world shattering. The one thing that it did was at all of a sudden, as of September of 61, the Confederates are operating in this portion of the Capes. And now they own the Hampton Roads and the Virginia Capes. So Confederate shipping, Confederate commercial shipping can now go use the Chesapeake Bay entrance. And the Union is no longer getting shipping to Baltimore. And that is where I'm going to leave us. For this episode, we are about 90 minutes in, and I'm going to leave us there. Um, September of 1861, the Confederates have functionally mortgaged their entire Navy on this wild plan to purchase a bunch of ships of dubious value and then throw them into a fight against the U.S. Navy that admittedly hadn't had time to prepare to fight a real naval fight. And they managed to pull out the win, forcing the U.S. Navy back to Baltimore to lick its wounds and try to recover for the next fight. The U.S. Navy also has ships being built elsewhere, but they are those ships are a couple... Those ships are anywhere from a couple months to over a year out in construction. So September 17th of 1861 in this game, the U.S. Navy is bottled up in Baltimore. Um, there is no U.S. Navy at sea. On the flip side, the Confederates are torn up bad enough that every ship they've got left that's active is also bottled up in the Virginia Capes keeping the Chesapeake Bay closed to Union shipping. But they have managed to take the entire naval war and compress it to a single land feature poking out into the water. So with that, with the end of the second Battle of the Capes, I am going to leave you until the next time.